What is up, everyone? Welcome to the Tell Me More podcast presented by Major League Success. I have Glenn Witten with me, and he's with the Ohio Property Group. And uh, I'm excited because this is the first time that myself and Glenn have have ever communicated with one another. I think we've been social media friends, you know, mm-hmm. like like a, a lot of real estate agents, right? You know, we're we're friends on social media, see each other's business. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm excited to have you on, Glenn, because you know we were chatting before um, jumping on here, and you know my whole my whole goal of of this podcast is just bringing in you know real estate agents that are performing at a high level. Um, that are doing transactions and just showing other people that there's several different ways to get to this specific part, you know, to becoming a real estate agent, as well as sev- several different ways of of finding your own success, right? Like my success mm-hmm. is not the same as your success, and I did it differently than how you're doing it. And um, you know, the whole point is, I believe that our failure rate, you know, of eighty seven percent or eighty six percent, whatever it is, by the end of year two for our industry does not need to be that high. I believe there's a better way no. of, of bringing people into this business and into this industry. And, and the more that we can share, you know, each agent's journey and each agent's success and what they focused on, um, that's, that's the whole goal. So Glenn, thank you so much for taking time out of your day um, to, to be here with me. My pleasure, John. Thanks for having me. So Glenn, where we always start is is the beginning, is is growing up, you know. And as I've done this for, uh, I guess, well over a year now, um, I always mm-hmm. find that there's there's parts of our our youth or early on in our career that that bleed into our real estate business at some point, right? So what was no what was life it. like for you? <laughs> yeah, you know, what was life like for you growing up? I. I grew up in a little town in Illinois, right on the Mississippi River on the western edge of Illinois. Uh, my mother was a writer. Uh, my father ran a factory, but he bought, um, you know, properties on the weekends, literally on the sheriff's courthouse steps, you know, from the auctions. And then we'd fix them up on the weekends and stuff and he'd rent them out. Uh, but I've just always had a little bit of both of them and pretty much everything I've ever done. Uh, but yeah, it was, I'm the youngest of six kids. Um, I started working when I was way too young. I was probably nine or 10 delivering papers and then shoveling sidewalks, mowing lawns, and eventually parlayed that into a uh, pretty regular gig. I got myself a job with my godparents. They ran a funeral home and I did their lawn care and cleaned their cars and shoveled their snow and did all that stuff. I did that all the way until I went to college because, you know, youngest of six kids, it's not exactly like my parents were just showering money on us. So, you know, they covered all the basics and then. If I wanted anything else, it was up to old Glenn to go find it. And so <laughs> I learned very, very quickly. I gotta, mm-hmm. Yeah, I got to ask yeah, go ahead. what what I uh, just this past holiday season, I actually drove out to Kansas City. So that was actually the first time in my adult mm-hmm. life that I, I went past Indianapolis going out that way. So what part, <laughs> what small town in Western <laughs> Illinois are you from? <laughs> uh, Fulton, Illinois. If you go, if you were to take, uh, for instance, I-80 across the, the the state, right where Illinois crosses into Iowa is a little cluster of cities called the Quad Cities. Um, okay. If you were just to go, go north, you know, maybe half hour, you'd run right into us. So. Okay. Okay. I've heard of Quad mm-hmm. Cities before because there's actually a real mm-hmm. estate agent here in central Ohio that's from the Quad Cities. So I'm a, really? I'm a nerd when it comes to like maps and geography and all those things. I don't know. It's just, yeah. I always have to ask. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so you, so, you, um, small town, you know, mm-hmm. and, and found out quickly, you know, it sounds like from growing up that, you know, you had to go out and hustle if you wanted, you know, the extra stuff yep. or, um, how did you, you know, was it just from, from growing up with the family dynamic of, of that work ethic, or did you always have kind of like that go getter entrepreneurship, you know, mentality? Well, I, I, I have to think it came from my folks because, um, all of my siblings did the same thing. You know, we all hustled. They all, I've lost count of the number of small businesses that my siblings and I have started and either lost or sold or or still doing, or, you know, we've, none of us have taken like a pure, just, you know, 
go to high school, go to college, get a job, you know, work till you retire. Um, none of us have, no, not a lot of people haven't done that, but literally all six of us have taken these crazy paths. So I got to yeah. think that mom and dad had something to do with it. I mean, he, even though he worked a regular factory job all those years, he, he always had stuff going on the side and usually it was rental properties. He would buy them and I, don't, I honestly can't remember him ever selling one. I'm sure he he must have at some point. But, you know, when he passed away, he he had several dozen that he was still sitting on from the 70s. So um, and then my mom, when uh, we got old enough to, you know, for her to do other stuff, she would um, she worked for all these different newspapers. She would write stories and then try to sell them to the news. She didn't have like a regular editor job or anything that came later. But. You know, and she was always just skipping through that industry, doing different things and moving up and up. And so I, I guess it's just always been, there's never a question that, that, that if you were going to make your way, you were going to make your way. You know, and it might be working for somebody else, but there's always this other option. You know, they never, I never had the whole, I, I read a lot of stories about entrepreneurs and you, you, you almost invariably, you find that their family was supportive of the concept you know, versus other people who are like, oh my God, you can't start a business. You're going to fail. And, you know, <laughs> I never heard that growing up ever. Yeah. Nope. No, that's, I mean, I think that it's a huge difference too, you know, just mentality mindset. Um, and I think about this a lot and it's kind of in this regards, it's like, you know, as kids and stuff, you know, we're told to dream and, and to uh, think big and we can be whatever we want. Yep. And then right around like that, what? Mm -hmm. 11 12 13 society yep. you know parents the mm -hmm. other pressures of of other kids it's you know kind of like brings you back in it's like oh no here's you know mm -hmm. here's the way that you know you need to go the path that you need to take um was <laughs> was real estate something that you took interest in early on with with your your dad and your family buying up rental properties or was it like yeah this is great but mm, not really for me so you know what I took away from it was the handiwork, you know, the that I could always fix stuff at my own house. I really liked that. And that stuck with me all through. But no, no, the investing part or any of that stuff never really became that's not why I got into it. Um no, I I uh, you know, I had always planned on being like a lawyer or something. I I wanted to be a lawyer since I was old enough to crawl. And then uh when I got into high school, just stuff happened. I mean, we can talk about it, but stuff happened and it led me down a completely different path. But no, I, I don't think that I, it must have laid there dormant, you know, like a seed that finally gets some sunlight or something because much later in my thirties, then all of a sudden this became a central focus of my life. Uh, but yeah, let's, no. um, yeah, let's, let's, let's lead up, go up to, you know, high school years, um, you know, after high school, I know you said, you know, you didn't really do the traditional college route kind of lead me up to, you know, high school, then your first kind of career, you know, focus. Well, that's the funny thing. As much as we were encouraged, my mom desperately wanted us all to go to college. So uh, I went to, I was going to public school and along about seventh or eighth grade, I was doing some stupid stuff. And my mother, instead of, you know, coming down on me like a ton of bricks, she just decided she was going to have me visit another school. So she had me visit this uh, Christian school private Christian school. And we weren't what I would call a, an overly religious family or anything, but mm -hmm. you know, I go from the bigger public school, even in a small town like that to this tiny little school. I graduated with eight people, me, and <laughs> I was one of those eight. So it is a very, very small school. So that was just how she was brilliant about stuff like that. Instead of taking the, the usual punishment, lock you down type path. She's just like, you know what, I'll put them in a different environment and see how that goes. And she didn't force me. She made it let's just say very, very attractive to go and very, very unattractive not to go, but she did not force me. Um, I think she learned with my older sisters. That was probably a terrible idea, <laughs> but, but uh, so that, and, and I'm, so I'm, I'm rolling along um, and I decided, I don't know why I decided to take three languages at the same time. So I'm taking German, Spanish, and Latin at the same time. Wow. Oh, it was horrible. It was awful. And I want it to drop Latin. And it was taught by the school principal. So that was not fun. He was like, a, he's a minister, but he was also, he must have been a used car salesman or something in another life because he opened like every sentence with, here's the deal, here's the deal. So I go to him, I tell him, hey, I'm, I need to drop one of these languages and I want to drop Latin. And he said, all right, well, here's the deal. 
they need guys in the choir. So if you want to drop Latin, you have to join choir. I'm just like, what? what? And he said, take it or leave it. I don't care, but that's it. So I joined choir and um, I ended up getting away from wanting to be a lawyer and I just fell in love with music. So I actually did go to college for music. Um, okay. And I went right, right out of high school. I went over to, uh, there's a little college in uh, a liberal arts college in Iowa, uh, in Mount Vernon, Iowa called Cornell College. And uh, it's a, it's a unique setting, but, uh, and I, I majored in music and did it for four years and graduated on time and all that good stuff. And, you know, I would have never seen that coming if it hadn't been for Mr. Mr. Biker, my principal, you know, shoving me down this other path. But did you, that's the way did life you works, have, right? yeah, did you have interest in music prior to that? Or is that where you just kind of fell in love with it? Um, I was in school band, you know, I played the drums and, you know, thoughts I'd always probably, I had a drum set and thought it would be pretty cool, but becoming a singer was never in the car. I, I was, honestly, I was pretty pissed about it. Um, I went home and said something to my mom. I'm like, he can't make me do that. And she was like, apparently he can. So, I mean, you have a choice. So it's not like he made you. So whatever. So yeah, I begrudgingly went to choir and just immediately was like, enthralled with this idea and started taking singing lessons and started joining other things outside of high school. And it really became the central part of my life for a number of years after that. And, and the know. seeking of the seeking of the, the extra things outside of school, you know, in order to get mm -hmm. better, was that something that you just did and, and seeked out yourself or was it recommended? Like, cause I think about myself, you know, like growing up, like I wasn't out there trying mm -hmm. to get better at x y and z while in <laughs> high school i was i was like hey I, i'm playing sports i'm going to school that's what i'm doing you know like so i i want to I'm, I'm just curious because i think that probably will lead into you know your success into real estate as to that that mindset of wanting to seek out to be better uh you know now that you put it that way i guess i never connected those dots so hats off to you for that um i was my girlfriend at the time um, she was a, a year older than me and from Iowa, cause it's right. It, it was, you know, two minutes across the river. So we had a lot of kids. Well, we didn't have a lot of kids. We had a percentage of children who went to my school that were not from my town. They came from other towns, but sure. anyway, um, and her mom played piano for the local college over in Iowa, Mount, Mount St. Clair college. Uh, she did a lot of things with the theater and things like that. And she heard about this audition, um, for uh, they were doing a production of Godspell, like an old '70s musical, and uh, so she was like, "You guys should you should audition." So I go over and I audition, and one thing leads to another, and I get a part. And then the people running that were like, "No, you should probably think about taking lessons." So we several of us from my school started taking lessons with a lady at the college. So that was kind of my next leapfrog as to, uh, and it was a real catalyst for then deciding to study music in college, because now I'm seeing it at a higher level. I'm seeing more possibilities. Um, my dad, I honestly wasn't that, that thrilled about this whole, you're going to, you're going to go to college, spend all this money and you're going to walk out with a degree in music. Like you really needed to, you know, but whatever he, he, he kind of left it there, but yeah, that, I guess I never thought about that, but I took lessons all through college because part of the, you know, if you're going to major in music, you, you, you have to take a lot of lessons. And so, um, it did stick with me. I've, I've, uh, honestly, I couldn't tell you, I probably could put another kid through college for as much coaching as I've purchased over the years, whether it was, <laughs> you know, for the jobs I had or for, for some skill I wanted that I would then go seek out somebody who was offering that. Now we can do it online, but back in the day, you had to either buy courses or you had to go right. see experts, but yeah, you're right. right. Starting then there probably wasn't much, many gaps at all where I wasn't paying for coaching. Of some kind. And it's just, it's, it's just, no, it's fascinating to me because, you know, I, part of what I, my story and what I tell people is like, you know, I got lucky when I got into this business. And, and part of that was because my mentor and, and my team lead, I'm still on the same team since day one. I've been doing it for 12 mm -hmm. years now. Day one, I had coaching, you know, real estate coaching. Mm -hmm. I grew up in sports. So I get the, I get the value of coaching just in, yep. in that regards. But from, from an actual business standpoint, you know, the power of having a coach to, to help you get to wherever you want to get to. Right. So I was just curious about that. And, um, so when, so when you went to college, was the goal then like with graduating, just 
getting into the music industry. Lead me up to kind of post college. You know, what what were so, some of the things that you were doing? About three years into college, it dawned on me that I'm going to have to figure out how to make a living when I get out of college, or I could go to grad school. You know, and a lot of people who majored in music, and I majored in performance, so I couldn't even go teach. I couldn't like I. This is it. I walked out with a highly specialized degree in vocal performance. Not a lot mm-hmm. of people hiring for that. So, you know, to, the, the natural progression of that is either to move to some major city like a New York or something and try to, you know, get on stage somewhere or to go to grad school and maybe eventually start teaching at the college level. Mm-hmm. Um, quite honestly, neither one of those appealed to me at all. So um, here I am you know, trying to figure out, okay, I'm a year from graduation and this is just hitting me. This is that I can hear my dad, you know? And, uh, so I went ahead and finished up, had a blast. I loved college. And then, uh, when I got out of college, I went to work for, uh, there's a company in Iowa city. Well, actually they're all over Iowa, but it's a music store, right? It's a music retailer and they sell everything, anything to do with music. Mm-hmm. They sell it, whether it's a, you know, instruments or musical stuff. They, they sell lessons. They, they have a national catalog. I mean, they, they did it all. And I didn't know any of this at the time. I just needed a job. So uh, a buddy of mine who had graduated a couple of years before me was working there and he kind of helped me get an interview. And uh, I went to work there and, you know, right after, you know, some short time after college, um, I went to work at West Music in, uh, in Coralville, Iowa, just outside of Iowa City. And they had eight stores, uh, family run, third generation, um, well, second generation, now third generation, but, uh, um, and I stayed there for nine years. Wow. Mm-hmm. And then what, Loved what, it. um, what led you, what was, so you were just kind of, did you end up like moving up, running a store? Um, oh yeah, yeah, have... yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they had, you gotta understand this is, it, they had eight stores at a catalog business. Uh, but there were only 250 employees across all of that. So it was pretty close knit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, every day I went to work um, for the first couple of years and the owner was sitting in his office, you know, right, right over there. And so I had a lot of contact. The, the, we'll just say the, the organizational chart was pretty flat. You know, he had a few people <laughs> that ran key areas, but pretty much he he was your mentor. Um, and he was his name is Steve West. And he was like another father. He was great. And uh but anyway, over the course of a few years, after some training and some running a couple of small departments, uh, they had an opening at the Cedar Rapids store, so uh, which was up the road. And it was the next largest store. So it was a huge step. I was 26 at the time. Uh, I was in way over my head. Um, <laughs> my average, I would guess the average age of my staff of 10, 12 people was probably in their late 30s, early 40s. All of them had been there longer than me. And let me just tell you, it was not a warm welcome when I got there. Uh, there were a couple of people not very happy about it. And, but that's a, that's a whole other podcast. But anyway, yeah. I, did what, I did what I always do. I went out and I got coaching. I, I found a, a company in Colorado that coached retail managers, if you can believe that. Talk about a niche. Oh, wow. Um, and they had some seminars, which I went to a couple of their three-day seminars. And then they had some, uh, <clears throat> like workbooks and things you could buy. And I just drank it all in and implemented almost everything into my little store. And we started to show pretty, pretty, once we worked out a few kinks with the staffing, there were a couple of, you know, we'll just say some that were not a good cultural fit. Um, sure. They ended up, they ended up finding other gainful employment elsewhere. And then uh, I ended up with the nucleus of a team for several years that stayed the same. We didn't have any turnover for several years. And wow. They were unbelievable. Like I'm getting emotional thinking about those guys. Uh, they were so yeah. good. Um, but uh, you know, and I really, honestly, John, I thought I would. Well, just like I thought I was going to be a lawyer, I thought I was going to retire at that company. I was, I was actually pretty convinced I was going to retire there, but I didn't. Clear. No, that's awesome. What is um? What's one thing I, I'm curious, just because I I love you know I run a uh, help run a large team and and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, managing people, right? What's one thing that you took away from that coaching on retail management that you implemented? I would say the central theme of it was to set expectations, um, to train the hell out of those expectations, and then to hold people accountable. And then Mm. fourth, so you've got 
they called it, here's what I want you to do. So that's setting expectations. Here's how I want you to do it, which is the training piece. Uh, and then last is, here's how you did, uh, which is the, the, the accountability. Sorry, that's the, the last is, here's what you get, which would be, mm. you know, you're either going to get praised and rewarded and maybe paid a little more, maybe promoted, or you're going to get coached and disciplined. And maybe we find out this is not for you. Uh, but either way, I mean, it's such a clear four piece model, you know, and and when you're 26 and you're completely swimming with alligators and totally over your head, this is very attractive. Um, and the three day seminars, I don't know if they still do them or not, but three day seminars were like intensive boot camps of we're going to drill you on all four of these things over and over and over and over to give you the confidence to go back to your store and make this stuff happen. Now, mind you, the company didn't know I was doing any of this stuff. Uh, yeah, just, I just was like, hey, I need a couple of days off. They're like, OK, go have fun, you know, <laughs> and I come back with these big binders and my team is just like, oh, God, no. <laughs> but that that was those four central pieces were probably what put us on track and then kept us on track um, for, for years. Um, eventually, it was adopted company wide. A lot of that stuff. So. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's great. What, so, so you're there for about nine years. Um, mm -hmm. Lead me up to the time of, of you getting, you know, thinking, okay, I'm going, I'm getting into real estate and, and uh, kind of lead me up to that, to the decision. And, sure. and I would say, so in uh, when I was about a year or two after I got that store, um, I started having kids. So, you know, we're, one, and then we're two, and then we're three. And when, within two and a half years, we had three kids. And so, you know, here we are living in the middle of Iowa, and my wife's family was living in Ohio. Um, and I should mention that was my first wife. I'm, I'm with my second wife now, in case she's listening. Anyway, my first wife uh, is, is living in Iowa. I'm working a lot, and she's essentially by herself. She's got friends and things like that, but, you know, quite honestly, all her family is in Ohio. And yeah. her sister, she has one sibling, uh, her sister and kids who were about our kid's age, her mom, her grandma, aunts, uncles, everybody's living in this little town of New Bremen, Ohio, out in Oglaze County. And every, well, I got to hear about this a lot. I hear about it a lot. <laughs> and we go there to visit because her whole family's there. So anytime we can get out that way, we stop in. And, you know, while all this is happening over a several year period, you know, we're having these kids, anytime the kids couldn't sleep, I'd put them in the truck, put them in their little car seat, and then I would just drive around. I used to spend my lunch hours just driving around looking at real estate. You know, just part of it was I wanted to buy, but then it was more fascinating than that. You know, like, I wonder how these people get paid. Like, I didn't even understand. I didn't get any of that. Sure. Um, and a friend of mine uh, was a partner at a, at a private uh, real estate firm in Iowa City, and he kind of broke all this stuff down for me. And it became like, wow, he's like the coolest person I know. And I probably had a little bromance thing going on there, if you can be <laughs> honest. Because he's tan and he golfs all the time and he drives a BMW and he's like, like, wow, this dude has got it. And he seems to just never work. He's probably always working, <laughs> but it just looks like, where's Kevin? Yeah. Oh, he's at lunch. He's at the club. He's and it's just like, wow, what, what is this? How do you do this? So I became very <laughs> fascinated with it. So anytime my kids couldn't sleep or anytime I had some downtime I needed to decompress, I would drive around and look at property that's for sale. And then I'd go, it's pre-internet, of course, then I would go find the real estate book or something and like the, the magazines and stuff. And yeah. Just, I don't know, it became pretty fascinating. It was the same when we visited New Bremen. When the kids couldn't sleep, I put them in the car and I'd drive around, drive around. And I kept seeing these Remax signs from this guy named Lowell Ziegenbush. I will never forget this man. And New Bremen's not very big. It's like three, 4,000 people. But every freaking sign, really, dude, he's, he has the whole town. And there yeah. was dozens, dozens. There was a new development. There was rentals. And everywhere you go, there he is. And his face was on the sign. And so I'm like, this guy's got an empire, the Lowell Ziegenbush empire. And uh, <laughs> I would joke with my wife, of like, someday I'm going to I'm gonna get me some of that, 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 that Lowell Ziegenbush empire. I don't know how. I don't know when. So one night we're, we're in New Bremen. This would be... 99 we're hanging out at the fish fry the legion i guess has them a lot <laughs> i'm at the fish fry with my in-laws they grew up there and lo and behold who's sitting across from me but the the emperor right yeah there he is yeah and i'm like 
holy cow, that's the guy on the side. <laughs> and there's hundreds of people at this thing. So I poked my father-in-law and he's like, yeah, that's Lowell. I went to high school with him. Like they know each other, of course. <laughs> so he introduces me. We end up talking for hours and I'm still working in Iowa. I'm still loving life. Um, my wife really is hinting pretty hard at this point that we should probably get closer to her family because she needs help on and on. And so everything kind of dovetailed. And he's like, he just tells me at the end of that visit, he says, you know, I'm going to be really blunt with you. I'm in my 60s. I don't want to do this forever. My kids don't want anything to do with this business. Like they, they've all got their own careers. I, I think this could work. Like you should seriously consider he's recruiting me, right? That's the stupid fish fry. He's recruiting me. And so uh, he did a great job of it too. He painted a very clear path on how I could, I could come onto his team. Um, I could be a, you know, a buyer's agent for him. He would teach me, he would train me. And then, you know, sort of this nebulous time in the future, two, several years out, then maybe we can work on a, a, on a succession plan. Right. And so honestly, fast forward over the next 12 months, I went back, I, quit my job. I sold my house. We packed everything up and we looked like the Beverly Hillbillies. Just we <laughs> cruised across 12 hours across this, the, all those states and uh, rented a house for a little while. And I went to work for Remax and that's, that's how I got in. So that would have been what? 20, 2000, 2000. Yep. 2000. Okay. Yeah, yep. And uh, you know, from there, I mean, just that conversation, I, and it's always fascinating to me because I I know that I like you said earlier the seed of probably your dad buying those investment properties probably which is what fascinated you with just the driving around probably you know and mm-hmm. and and then that just you know spread from there um you know when you got into the business I'm always curious okay you know leaving a, a for you a job and a state. <laughs> coming to, to a brand new area where you didn't really know mm-hmm. anyone, obviously, you know, you nope. had family that did. Um, but going from a, a secure job to, Hey, you're, you're commissioned now. Good luck. Doubters, supporters. I mean, you had family to consider kids, you know, all of that stuff. Um, did you have a lot of people in your corner? So it depends on where you were in the United States. So if my whole family's in Illinois, so as supportive as they were, it was more like, well, why can't you just do that where you live? Like, if you're going to throw it all away, just do it from your house. Like, why, why do you have to move? I'm like, well, because there's not a Lowell Ziegenbush empire um, <laughs> here. And I, and he's, he's offering to, you know, show me the way. And, yeah. and so then my, oh, my, the, the people at the music store were of course not very thrilled about this because they had plans for me retiring there. And right. the owner, um, it was right around the time of my youngest daughter's first birthday party. So they actually, they came, that's, that's the kind of company it was. They came to her mm-hmm. birthday party. Her, mm-hmm. him, um, several other key members of his leadership team came to this thing. Um, and they did anyway. They, it's not like they just finally showed up. They, they were right, at all that right. stuff. But anyway, so we're sitting down and we're eating cake and he's just like, you know, I know you're friends with Kevin. Why don't you just go to work for Kevin? He can teach you. I'm just like, you know, I don't, I don't know how to explain it to you. All I know is I have to do this. I don't, I, mm. to this day, I couldn't tell you why. And, you know, lots, there's been lots of theories about why I did what I did, but this is not unprecedented before or since I've done a lot of crazy stuff in my life. And most of it happens not necessarily at the Legion fish fry, but something, whatever <laughs> is the local and current equivalent of that. That's how I make decisions. Um, For some reason, the pieces are all up here. And then one minute, they're all right here. And they're in perfect focus, right or wrong. They're in perfect focus. And then I go and I don't look back. So, Mm. yeah, there were plenty of doubters and there were plenty of supporters. And all were, nobody was totally in one camp or the other, unless they had a vested interest in how this turned out. Um, But even the owners of the the music store were kind of like after that cake conversation, were kind of, you know what? It's okay, kid. Go do your thing. Um, we hope that it works out for you. But if it doesn't, you know, you always have a home here. So, I mean, that was kind of nice, the safety yeah. net. But, but I'm also not, I, I don't even look back, much less go back. So, um, but it did feel good. It was some validation. And yes, I guess in the back of my mind, if I had any doubts, that was like calmed it down. My parents, but in, in, by then my parents were together. So dad was all in, you know, like, this is a great idea. 
um mom was she just cried she's like i can't believe you're taking my grandbabies that far because we were only like, like an hour and a half from her and now we're going to be like yeah. seven or eight hours away so yeah. that was but she understood mom always said if you if, you know you're never going to have a dream come true if you don't have a dream and this is mm -hmm. from a very early age that kind of stuff gets you know mm -hmm. well what's she going to do now <laughs> i'm chasing my dream uh so uh, but i would say the biggest doubter if there was one was probably me in the middle of the night, you know, like, am I just committing financial and career and all other ways suicide? Like, is this a burn your ships kind of moment? Yep, it is. It is. Let's, um, let's talk about that. What, what was the first couple years like for you in the business? You know, did you, did you just hit the ground running and, and have that success or was it the, you know, the slow and, and painful process of just trying to figure it out. I mean, I'm assuming it was, it was probably good because you had a mentor, right? Um, but let's talk, talk, yeah. talk about the first couple of years. So, I mean, I went head first into the deep end of the pool. I mean, cause now I went from steady income to no income and now I've, I've yeah. got to waste, I'm oh, sorry. I get to spend a month in real estate school. So I got that and I <laughs> legally can't do anything except train. I can't, you know, Lowell took me on some appointments with him. So I got to go see my first showing. I got to go see my first listing appointment and all the while I'm just, you know, a fly on the wall and he would just say, Hey, this yeah. is Glenn. He's, he's, he's new and just don't, don't worry about him. Uh, but then there was of course all the car conversations, you know, with him and time mm -hmm. in the office and they were very organized about certain things. But with technology, they were not so much. And I, I love technology. So, you know, I got to spend time working on their CRM. They had, um, what's that called? Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's not around anymore. It was like uh, agent office or something like that. It was, okay. it, remember, I, probably before you. But anyways, way back like before <laughs> Top Producer and all those, and, and even all the, the 5,000 ones that are out now. When, when, I, when I got in like Top yeah, when I got in Top Producer was like the, the, the one it was the, in the was. very beginning. And then, yeah. yeah. So uh, we used something called Agent Office, which was at the time I thought was a Remax product, but it was quite honestly, it was they just branded it for Remax for us. I didn't know yeah. that, but it was good. And and uh, so I learned how to use a CRM, and I had done that before in my old life as a salesperson. You you've got to keep track of your people. Um, you can't keep it all on little note cards the rest of your life. So um, so there was that, um, and I got to learn how to you know contracts and all that stuff. I'm getting all this stuff from real estate school, and then I'm going in and shadowing as much as I can on my time off and just like rocketing forward. Um, but once I got licensed, they essentially, they didn't want to work with buyers. That was very clear. It was, it was mm -hmm. Bull and his wife that were running it. Um, and we had an admin and we had, they had a, a, like a part-time buyer's agent. She, she left shortly after I got there, probably saw the writing on the wall. I don't really understand that whole relationship, but whatever. Sure. So they gave me all their buyer leads, all of them. Yeah. They're just like, they would, they would put them in this uh, bank bag. They were all handwritten, just just a phone number. That's it, that's all I got. So I got a <laughs> phone number and then they, they would make this big deal every morning. Well, here's your, they put them in a bank bag, right? Because you know, yeah. here's your money, right? Go get, go get your but, money. <laughs> right. So, and there wasn't a ton of, here's what to do with these. It was, you know, you're a sales guy, figure it out. Yeah. Well, then a few months later, they were, they were students of Craig Proctor. I don't know if you know that guy mm -hmm. up in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. So I got to go to my first, like he was having a thing up in Toronto. So I went to it, like I got it. And he had a whole section uh, with another agent. It was all about, um, it was a guy named Brian Moses from a Cola banker. And he was all about buyer agency. And, and now I've got a formula, right? Just like the old retail yeah. days. Now I've got a step-by-step -step thing I can follow. And that helped me tremendously because now i can okay now i see where yeah. this train's going and uh i just became relentless about cold i mean they called them they weren't cold calls they were cold calls buddy these were yeah these were these are people that called one of those info centers <laughs> and it says right in the ad you won't talk to an agent right right yeah. on the ad is a big red banner yeah. well guess who's calling them the next morning right this guy. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, there, and so nine times out of 10, it was just, it was terrible. Like I'd call, what are, you, what are you calling me for? And it's like, I have to figure out another way. And, and one day I got back from lunch and there was a message on my desk that said, Bill, somebody called and had a phone number, no address. I mean, it was a signed call, yeah. but 
So I call the guy. I'm like, hey, this is Glenn from Remax. And he's like, yeah. I said, I don't know. It says here you called about a house. He's like, I don't know, dude. I've called about so many houses. I Honestly, I don't, I don't know. This is one of my secrets, by the way. And I said, well, well, what are you looking for? Right. And the light goes off. So now every one of these calls I make, I'm just like, I don't know. I had a message you called about a house. They're like, yeah. Oh, and honestly, most people do that. They call so many places. If they're not working with a dedicated buyer's agent, they don't know who they called. They have no clue. Yeah. And they're just happy to have somebody sort of clear the fog for them. So that opened up my business. I did very, very well after that. I did that for two or three years. I just, and the whole time I was studying to get my broker's license. So, so that would have been early 2000s. I did that. 2000, 2001, 2002. Yep. So I know um, Brian Moses because I, I, my coaching program that I started with was was Kinder Reese, mm -hmm. and then it became NAEA with Jay Kinder, Mike Reese, and Jay was yep. a pro, you know, from Craig Proctor, and yep. um, Brian, and then Brian, you know, he knows Brian Moses, and I actually got to hear him speak several times at some of those conferences, and uh, one of Brian Moses's buyers agents that he used to have is Wally Bressler, um, yep. and oh. he he. Wally is how, you know, one of the coaches that I had very early in my career in 2011, 2012, 2013. And, and still to this Small day, world. I still to this day, I teach, we teach the NAEA, you know, buyer scripts, seller scripts, all that stuff. So I'm right there with you. <laughs> it's crazy. how so It's crazy. how a small right world after, that is. Right after that first Toronto seminar, cause I went three times um, right after the first one, Brian, he was still a Coldwell banker. I don't, I don't know if he still is or not, yeah. but he was still with them at the time. And he was just kind of getting his le his legs under him as a coach. And Craig Proctor was kind of bringing him along. And so Brian had his own seminar right after that, a couple months mm -hmm. later in Nashua, New Hampshire. Um, and I I flew out to that. Um, I got to yeah. tell you, I, I, I'm always a hound for, for good coaching. If I can get it, and even no matter what it costs me, no matter how much I got to rack up the, the credit cards, whatever I have to do. Because I know I'll make it back. I believe, I, you know, I'm investing in me. Yeah. So I go out yeah. and I got to spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with the guy just between sessions and things like that. And uh, he he's one of the most genuine giving type people you'll ever meet. Um, so, but I don't know what he's doing now. I've lost, lost track of him. I know he's still coaching, but. I was going to say he's still doing coaching. And, you know, the one thing about Brian is, is you can never tell him that he can't accomplish something. Has, have you heard you all of that? the wild stories? <laughs> you know like oh yeah though the letterman stuff and the <laughs> yeah. like when he got on the letterman show i'm sure you've heard that story yeah. and then uh, just yeah. is just in general like the whole the whole problem with the irs i mean it's all part of his origin story it's it's a great story and it's all real yeah. he's got the pictures of all the stuff and yeah it's he was very inspiring um yeah and w what's funny and we'll circle back to this is the plane ride out to that planted a seed that bore fruit about three years ago that, this yeah. was 20 um, years ago. Uh, that yeah. plane ride, I'm telling you, that plane ride changed my life. I just didn't know it at the time. Um, yeah, but, lead, me uh, up to, lead me up to kind of, you know, your your real estate career, right? After, you know, a couple of years, you said you were getting your, you are working towards yep. your broker's license. Lead me up to kind of like, you know, present day. So I got my broker's license and um, I assumed that we were on track, you know, that Lowell and I were going to, you know, have some, well, let's just say it didn't work out. So he and I had different versions of what the future looks like. And, and for any of you who are thinking of assuming someone else's business, whether it's in real estate or their shoe repair, but whatever it is they're doing, if they're bringing you on to apprentice, I'm going to implore you, go ahead and just hammer out the details now. You can change them later, but I will tell you, Lowell and I had such different expectations. Neither one of us was wrong or both of us were wrong. I don't know how you want to look at it. Right. Um, right. He was a great mentor to me. And uh, but as far as this whole. How is this going to work out? We had vastly different ideas and we never talked about them. So mm. bad on both of us. So it, it, and unfortunately, it ended up leading to some pretty, pretty dynamic conflict. The last sure. few few months I was there because once I got my broker's license, you know, I was free to do something else. So, of course, I'm sure I, I hit the pedal pretty hard. And he was probably like, you know, what, where is this coming from? You know, I'm like, let's go, let's go. 
Um, right. And so I ended up leaving there. Um, I started my own brokerage at the time. I, I opened a help you sell office up in Lima, Ohio in 2003. Mm. Um, and then I opened a follow up help you sell office in uh, Finley the next year um, and just was recruiting agents and, you know, it was flat fee, early, early flat fee stuff. I mean, they've been around since the seventies, but um, sure. But, you know, we were selling homes for, you know, that was my whole ad pitch was I'll sell your home for 1950. I mean, that was it. And yeah. that was it. That really was my whole ad pitch, by yeah. the way. And I had yeah. billboards and signs and ads and mailers. And, you know, I learned a lot about marketing during that process. Help you sell did a good job of making sure we understood not only the value, but the balance act of, of marketing. Sure. Um, took whatever I learned from Remax with me and then just tried to make my own, blaze my own trail. Um, and I did that for, oh, two or three years, um, got rid of the franchise, um, got a divorce, um, just needed to calm down for a little bit. And then, uh, but stuck with flat fee, really enjoyed flat fee and just sort of plodded along. And occasionally I'd take a job, you know, do, do stuff, just, you know, this is a, this is a grinding business and. Yeah. When you have kids and things like that, there's there's times when you got to face reality and that those times happened. You know, I never closed the brokerage, but uh, yeah. fortunately, a buddy of mine uh, who's still with me, he wanted to do property management, didn't have a broker's license. So anytime I was dormant, he was still rolling um, with yeah. his property management. And that kept my license going, kept the brokerage alive. And, you know, and I do deals here and there. And then I got more and more serious as the years went on. I got back heavier and heavier and, you know, eventually just that's, this is all I do. And then, it, you know, stop me if I go too fast, but in 2018, um, I decided I wanted to, to go virtual, 100% virtual. Um, not that I don't love meeting buyers and sellers, but there's only so much geography one person can cover in a given week. Yeah. And I like this, I like what we're doing here. This is what I do now. So, uh, yeah, to my knowledge, nobody around me was doing it. And nobody was doing it in flat fee. Um, so I took what I was doing at Help You Sell, which is helping sellers sell and getting them into the MLS and all that stuff. Um, and of course, the advent of limited service had come along in 06. So that helped me out quite a bit. I was able to do some other stuff. But I just, in 2018, just decided I wanted, I want to travel and I want to be able to work from anywhere. And so um, we went full on and i did lose some clients some were just like sure some long term like investor type clients were just like no i'm i i need the belly to belly i need the face to face yeah okay but guess what i got new clients and yep. shortly after that move uh we went statewide i joined 11 boards something like that a bunch of different i'm, I'm so i'm mls coverage in every county yeah. of ohio now um and then you know from there <laughs> It's been a wild ride. We moved to Puerto Rico in 2020 full time. Oh, awesome. Um, and I got to tell you, that's part of that plane ride is I met this old couple who was just all about travel, see the world. Don't ever, don't ever let your job, your bank account, anything. Don't ever let anything hold you back from seeing this world. Because by the time you get our age, he's got an oxygen mask. He's like, you're too old. Mm. You're too old to enjoy it. You know? So I'm telling you right now, do it. Go see the world now. Yeah. And that has always stuck with me. So when we had the chance to, now we're virtual, I'm freezing my tail off in another beautiful Ohio winter. And we were visiting Puerto Rico just for vacation, my wife and I, and we were just like, yeah, maybe we should buy an Airbnb here. You know? <laughs> just like, well, one thing led to another and we found our dream home and we bought it. And then we just, now we live here most of the year, not, not the whole year, but most of the year we're here quite yeah. a bit. There's but, a lot yeah. of agents that, yeah, there's a lot of agents that I know um, from, from EXP that live in Puerto Rico, you know, just mm -hmm. the, the tax, the tax benefits and all of those things mm -hmm. from, from that standpoint. Didn't so. even know about that. I didn't even know about that <laughs> when I moved here. I, I met a guy who's now, one of, he's now my attorney, but at the, I, I met him uh, like, yeah, had a, like a, I, like a food truck or something and we're BS and he's like, well, you probably moved here for the tax benefits. I'm like, I moved here for the weather, pal. And he's like, <laughs> you are an idiot. So yeah, he, he introduced me to all of that. But yeah. So, so when you decide to go virtual, mm -hmm. what does that look like for your business? Um, because I think, so, I mean, just for example, and this is why I love 
connecting with agents and and agents that are producing at a higher level. There's an agent that I know mm-hmm. he's not, he's now with EXP, but um, he's out of Arizona. His name's Curtis Johnson, and he has mm-hmm. a um, a video listing presentation to where essentially, if you were my seller, I would send you, hey, you want me to come out to your house? Okay, great. I'm going to send you this this video. Make sure you watch it. And he doesn't do an actual in person meeting or anything until after they watch the video and if they agree to work with him as as the agent. So what does that look like for you uh, in your space? Because I think, you know, it's just thinking differently. At, you know, why couldn't you do a, a video listing presentation and, and get someone to agree that you're the best fit for them? You know, what's funny is, is when you you got to start with your standards, you have to start with your parameters. Uh, you know, you build the life you want, whether it's ends up being the life you want or not, mm-hmm. your actions, your, your thoughts, your energy, your circle of friends, whatever it all created, whatever you're looking at today. So you can either let it happen or you can be intentional. In my case, I chose to be very intentional, which was, I need to be able to travel whenever, wherever. In fact, the line that's up on my wall is, um, we live, work and play anywhere, anytime we want worldwide because mm. money is all around us. Money is all around us, right? So this is kind of my, this is my mindset. And, you know, so if you're going to practice real estate, but you're not going to meet people face to face, that is a very narrow focus, my friend, very narrow. Yeah. But I was okay with that. I don't need a lot to live, right? I, how many listings do I actually need to pay the bills? Right. Not that many, right? Um, but if, the, the, the thing is, if you don't challenge, if you just roll with the status quo, you're going to have, what did you say, 87% failure rate? Yeah. Well, then you've got 87 chances in 100 to not make it. Mm-hmm. Somebody, hopefully lots of somebody's, has to challenge the way things are. And if you don't ever challenge it, you're never going to know. Even if it's a miserable, expensive, humiliating failure, you know, you're, I guarantee you're going to walk away with a lot of of newfound knowledge. Um, uh, who's the Dilbert guy? Scott, um, I can't think of his name. The guy that wrote all the Dilbert. He wrote a great book about this, about um, uh, how to how to fail millions of times and succeed. I, for, I forget what it's oh. called, but it's all about basically how to squeeze as much information out of every failure as you possibly can. Yeah. Um, and that, that, that lesson has stuck with me. So anytime we try, we've tried all kinds of stuff that did not work. I prefer to think of myself as ahead of my time. Some stuff just <laughs> is just a bad idea, right? <laughs> um, but like a video listing program, um, how about this? What if I could find a way to work with buyers virtually? Could I do that? Could I pull that off? Yeah. You know, and that's on the board. I mean, if you are focused enough on the end, you will find a way to get there eventually. Um, yeah. There is no shortage of technology. People are open-minded now, thanks to COVID. People are used to working remotely now. So this isn't such a, when I was doing this you know, before COVID, people were just like, wow, what are you nuts? I'm like, <laughs> you know, uh, I think there's lots and lots of things we could be doing differently in the business that would lend itself to people being more successful, but both clients yeah. and realtors. Um, yeah. So, but we gotta, we gotta be willing to pick on the the bully first. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. I just love listening. And and like I said, there's no one right way to find that success in this business. And um, I want to be respectful of your time. And I know we're, we're getting close to to it, but I want to kind of fast forward a little bit because um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm fascinated, you know, with with where you want to get to next. What's something that you're looking to accomplish here in the next year? <sighs> so. I wish you'd asked me that a year ago. A year ago, my burning <laughs> desire was to write a book. And then I finished it. So my book is done and I'm super happy about it. So now I got to have a new mountain, right? So I would say, you know, I've got a very uh, close knit team. It's my son, Justin, works for me full time. He's an agent. And my daughter, Tasia, uh, she works for me full time. And they, of course, both work remotely from their, their homes in Ohio. Um, they're both licensed and they both work for me full time. Uh, but I don't even say they work for me. We we just we just do, you know. It's yeah, like family yeah. dinner, you know, with a little bit more professionalism. Not much, but a little bit, yeah. a tiny bit more. <laughs> um, and so this, in a very real way, John, this is my dream. You know, I've got my little brokerage. 
I'm able to travel. I'm able to go to the beach whenever I want. I get to work with people that I, of course, near and dear to my heart. Um, and I'm watching them succeed in ways I could have never imagined, to be honest. They're, they're so, they are not following my lead. They're, they're doing their own thing. And they're taking yeah. this business in directions that I, I, I didn't even conceive of. And uh, so I'm super proud of them in case you can't tell. But I would say I want to hire the rest of my kids if I can. If they're listening, you should all come work for me. <laughs> uh, the other is I think I think as I am, you know, I'm in my 50s and I, I really just want to create content. That's all I want to do. I want to write. I want to interact with people. I want to learn um, what it what makes a seller tick, what makes an investor tick, you know, what makes a buyer tick. And what makes, I don't know, every, maybe 10 more books, you know, I don't know. I don't know where the end is. Uh, Maybe other states. I I don't really know. I'm just, I know that we've barely scratched the surface of what we can do in our market. So um, I would say just to grow personally, professionally, um, revenue, listing, impact, all of it. I want to grow all of it. No, I love it. What's the name of your book? It's called You Can Sell It. It's targeted at home sellers who are either, you know, hopefully they're going to hire somebody. I mean, realtors like you to hire realtors. Um, (laughs) But whether they do or they don't, I mean, I'm a realist. You know, I've tried to break down the entire process, whether it's for home sellers, for startup realtors, or people who've never done listings before. It's on Amazon. It's on iTunes, Kindle, Audible, wherever. Wherever you go, it's there. Um, And uh, it's really just, it was a chance for me to get it all out of my head and move on uh, to other stuff. And it's one of my goal. It's one of my goals. I keep, I've been thinking about writing a book for, I don't even know, five, six years. You probably can't see it, but um, it real estate cheat code, right? That's so that's the idea. I like um, it. That's awesome. I'm, I'm going to pick it up. I'll talk to you offline about this because there were some tools that took that from a 20 year to do list item to making it happen. And uh, I, I can share those with you because they are, they're kind of like disproportionate returns type tools and they're not, yeah. they're free. Most of them are free, but it's more about it. right up here. It's right here. Yeah. 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 Most of it. No, I love yeah. it. Glenn, what are you yeah. looking to do in the next mm-hmm. five years? Um, I would say just keep expanding, um, keep traveling, you know, from a per- personally, I would like to see more of this world while I can still get around. And, you know, my wife and I love to travel. Um, we do as often as we can. Um, you know, it's funny. All of our vacations used to be to tropical locations, all of them, <laughs> until we moved to one. Yeah, and now all of our vacations are to other places that we've, you know, we're seeing the United States uh, one state at a time. And it's been, it's, it's been fascinating. I would like to see my kids um, become whatever it is they want to become. You know, they're all kind of chasing their own thing, you know, in their own way. And it's, yeah. it's even the, the two that work, we have six kids. And so the two, Justin and Tasia, you know, even though they're with me full time, they both have other dreams and I'm fully mm-hmm. on board with encourage, even if it sadly takes them away from me, that's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, they will be, that's okay. Because there's room for yeah. all of it, you know, not just in real estate. There's, there's room for all of it. Everybody should expand. Everybody should get to the point where, you know, they're, they're where they want to be, where you have to think up new dreams. <laughs> I like that. When you have to think of new dreams. I like that. Mm-hmm. Glenn, what's a, what's a legacy goal for you? What's a goal you want to hit when you're no longer here? I have not given one moment. I'm going to live to be 120. So it's, I got a while to come up with this one. <laughs> uh, when I'm not here, I would like to see, um, real change in the real estate industry. I'm not giving it a wholesale indictment. It's not that. I just think right. You know, just just the based on the one thing you quoted at the beginning of this episode, that is deplorable. You know, any other industry that has that kind of crash and burn rate, um, especially when we have two million members, right? Yeah. You know, there are more licensed realtors than there are homes for sale right now. I mean we should not. Something is wrong. There's a systemic problem. And I, I, I don't know the answer. I'm not pretending to. I'm just saying sure. that I would like to see in some tiny way that I could at least contribute to the conversation. Yeah. 
you know, you know, we, we do know what the answer is. The answer is what you had very in the very beginning of you getting licensed and what I had in the very beginning of me getting licensed. Mm-hmm. Someone that said, mm-hmm. Hey John, Hey Glenn, like, all right, follow me around. I will show you <laughs> how success in real estate works and, and looks like. So, um, no, I love it. I'm right there with you. I mean, that's what, uh, that's my passion. We're going to need a pit, is, picture. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, that's I said my, we're going to need a picture of beer to sort that one out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm probably going to need more than that. This is, <laughs> <laughs> but this is why, you know, when this popped up on, on my email, um, I was like, you know what, any, any chance I can get to, to, to confab with other realtors about this industry is time well spent. Um, I, I'm super happy with what I, uh, you know, now I've discovered you, I've, I've heard uh, several of your episodes and they are very uplifting. I will definitely grant you that they, they, they do take you to a better place. So yeah, keep it up. I have, I have, I have thank you. Thank you. I have one mm-hmm. last question for you yeah. um, before we, before we end. And, um, if you could mm-hmm. give the audience one piece of advice that you wish that you either had starting out, uh, in this business or one that you just give agents in general about the business, what would that be? Well, I'm, I'm going to take advantage of you and say two, there's two. The first would be specialize. I think it's two. We see it all the time, right? The billboards, you know, thinking of buying or selling your condo, your house, your farm, your mini farm, you're thinking of renting, you know, there's this whole litany of things. Call me, right? How many times have you seen that billboard? Yeah. So do you, do you ever just want to sneak out in the middle of the night with a big piece of your big old spray can and write, <laughs> why? Like, why? Why should I call you? Um, and no disrespect to them. They're just doing what they were taught and what they were told. Um, yeah. But I think if you're going to succeed, at least in the short run and probably in the long run, you know, specialists on average, Craig Proctor, earn 10 times more than generalists. Mm. If you want to be known as the condo person in this zip code, or you want to be the mini farm, or you want to be the rehab specialist, whatever it is, go for that, become the absolute Western hemisphere expert on that topic. And people, you, your business will grow. Um, it's, it's just scary because you feel like you're cutting off all these other avenues. Um, yeah. But you're not going to get wild referrals for being average. So um, that, that would be one. The other is study marketing and never ever let go of it don't ever abdicate marketing to anyone in your company if you if your name is on the door you need to be very hands-on with your marketing Um, because if i think if you talk to those 87 percent that crashed and burned i would guess most of them said they ran out of money right i mean why else would they get out nobody was making millions of dollars it's just ah, tired (laughs) of it i ran out of places to put my money so they probably ran out of money and probably the, the one thing they needed more than anything was leads. They needed lead flow. Yeah. Well, where does that come? It comes from marketing. Um, so I yeah. think those two pieces of advice go hand in hand personally, but but that's what new people should be taught. And, and I guess to your point, they need a mentor. Everybody needs, I don't care where you are in this business. I have a mentor. You probably have yeah. a mentor. I know you do. You just told me. Yeah. You never, ever let go yeah. of that. Michael Jordan had a coach forever, right? Yeah. Yep. I love it. I think you're, you're, you're spot on. Um, and, and Glenn, I appreciate you jumping on with me, even down from, yeah. from Puerto Rico, your weather's what way nicer than what, than what ours is. But, um, Glenn, for those that are, are listening in that, that haven't been able to see, you know, the best way to access you, um, you know, if they have questions, an agent or a seller or someone that's, you know, wants to talk to you about mm-hmm. real estate, what is the best way for them to reach out to you? Um, I would say just to email me, it's Glenn, G-L-E-N, at ohiopropertygroup.com. So that should be easy enough to follow. Um, we have all sorts of socials and websites and things, but they're kind of a mouthful. So uh, you could also buy my book and, you know, find me that way. But uh, <laughs> yes, either way. If you, yeah. yeah, if you got, you know, if you guys got anything, you know, from Glenn, please mm-hmm. do him a favor. Um, he, he, he gave us his time today. Please go pick up his book on Amazon. I'm going to go pick it up myself. Uh, but Glenn, thank you so much for today. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed the conversation and getting to know you, um, you know, a, a lot more than, than what I 
did on air quotes, social media friends. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but thank Fair you enough. so much for today. I appreciate you. And if mm-hmm. obviously we're going to connect offline here and, and we're going to jump on another call. So that way uh, I can help you with, with some stuff and you can help me. Sounds good. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Awesome. I'll talk to you here soon.